that comes to us in the book of Judges in the Hebrew Bible. At that time, Deborah, a prophet, wife of Lapidot, was judging Israel. She used to sit under the palm tree of Deborah between Ramah and Bethel in the hill country of Ephraim. And the Israelites came up to her for judgment. She sent and summoned Barak, son of Abinoam, from Kadesh in Naphtali, and said to him, The Lord, the God of Israel, commands you, position yourself at Mount Tabor, taking 10,000 from the tribe of Naphtali and the tribe of Zebulun. I will draw out Sisera, the general of Jabin's army, to meet you by the Wadi Kishon with his chariots, chariots and his troops, and I will give him into your hand. And Barak said to her, Barak said to her, if you go with me, I'll go. But if you will not go with me, I will not go. And she said, I'll surely go with you. Nevertheless, the road on which you are going will lead to your glory. For the Lord will sell Sisera into the hand of a woman. Then Deborah got up and went with Barak to Kadesh. And from Amos, we hear, let justice roll down like water and righteousness like an ever-flowing stream. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. I invite you to pray for me as I pray for you this morning. O oh God, may the words of my mouth and the meditation of our hearts be found acceptable to you. O oh God, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. I want to start by telling you all I had a wonderful, wonderful, wonderful vacation. I'm so glad I got to do it. I'll be 70 tomorrow, and I have been to Spokane and to Canada and Denver and L.A. twice. And anyway, it was a really fun trip on the train. And I tripped and fell in the bathroom, tripped over a suitcase and fell and spent one night in the emergency room. But we got out in time to get on the boat to Victoria, so we made it. And it was a wonderful, wonderful time. Our scripture this morning tells us about Deborah. And a lot of the scriptures that I read in the past said she was a judge. But what that really meant was that she was a political leader. She was a, not, not just, a, and she was a military leader. She was, she was in charge of this army when she called Barak and told him, you know, I need for you to go wipe out Sisera until we can get into the promised land. And uh, he said, well, I'm not going unless you go. <laughs> you're a great military leader. You're, you're going to have to lead me into that promised land. So they did. And uh, so it was she who had arranged, I think, pretty much for, for jail to remember that story about where they put the tent peg through Cicero's head. I don't want to preach too much on that. But what was so interesting about, to me about this story is she was a military leader. We don't hear about that much in early history that women were in charge. And Deborah is one of our heroes of the Hebrew Bible. And apparently a lot of people had faith and trust in her because if she'd sit under the palm tree and they'd come to her, to her for advice. That was her office. And... In many ways, I think it's, it's important for us to remember Deborah is the one who got, got the Israelites into the promised land. There was a lot of other, the book of Judges is just gruesome. And there are lots of bad things that happen. 
but it was the, that final battle uh, won by Deborah's army that got him into the promised land. I've been preaching uh, for two months from these note cards you have given me, and I got one that said women of the Bible, but I think there's more to this story than just the fact she was a woman. Well, another thing that was really interesting, in order to for the people, for whoever wrote the story down or whoever told the story, to legitimize her, they, she had to be married. She had to name her husband. She wasn't just Deborah on her own. She was somebody's wife. In those days, wives were property. But somehow or another, she managed to manage to be a military leader. And she got God's people into the promised land. Well, a few hundred years later, the Persians came into Jerusalem, into the promised land, and sacked the city and took all the people out uh, that had any education or skills or whatever, and they took them to Persia which is now Iran, or what, and I don't know what they would have called it back then, but they called it Persia back then. And so they wiped them all out, wiped out Jerusalem, took all the good, the gold and the expensive stuff from the temple and left the town in ruins and took all the rich people to make them slaves for Persia. And among those people was this man named Mordecai. And most of his people had been killed off, but he had a niece. And her parents had been killed. So he took this little gal under his wing and said he'd take care of her. Well, Xerxes was the king, the Persian king at that time. Apparently he ruled with an iron fist. And he sent for his wife to come see him. And she said, her name was Vashti. And she said, I'm not going to go see him. So he sent a messenger a second time. I don't want to see him. So all the men got together and said, we're not going to let our wives treat us this way. We're going to make sure that Vashti becomes an example for everybody else. You don't say no to your husband. So he kind of ditched her. He didn't kill her, but he took all her power away. And then he said, now I want me, I want me a nice young virgin. We are going to search high and low for this nice young virgin. So Mordecai had heard about this and he said, he told this gal, Esther, you go prance around in front of the king, see if he likes you, but do not tell him you're a Jew. And she, so she, she pranced around and he liked her the best and so he married her and made her the queen. And so one day she was passing by the throne, and he said, Oh, my beautiful queen, what can I do for you? I will do anything you want. And she said, Well, let's have a banquet. You and me and... I forgot his name now. Haman. You and me and Haman. I want to have this beautiful dinner. And so he's, he says, Okay, we'll, we'll arrange for this banquet for three. And... So he said to her, now tell me what it is you really, really want. She said, I'll tell you at the banquet. Meanwhile, Haman had contacted everybody in that Persian area and told them that they were going to get rid of the Jews, told them to have the Jews all killed. And somehow or another, Esther was getting some communication back and forth from Mordecai, and he told her, he said, you may be a woman, but you're the only one who can save our people. So, what happened at dinner? This, I'm just giving you a short version. You can read the whole book. It's only ten chapters. But what was interesting, they did get to the banquet. And so the king asks finally, Queen Esther, what is it that you would want from me? I will give you half the earth and all the moon and all the, you know, made her all these promises. And she said, I really want you to save my people. And he said, well, of course. 
I'll save your people. That's what you ask of me, and I told you I would do what you wanted. Haman's sitting over there saying, she's a Jew, she's a Jew. And so the king asked Esther again, what is it that you would have of me? And why would you want me to save your people? And she told him who her people were, and he said, well, why are they in danger? Well, there is this one, she said, there's a man who's been trying to get them all killed off. And he goes, well, I'll take care of him. I'll have his head. And Haman's sitting right over there looking at him. He was the other third party at the dinner. Well, it wasn't long till somebody came and got Haman out, out, out of the banquet hall. And that was the end of him. And Esther saved the Jewish people, the remnant of the Jewish people who had gone into captivity in Persia. And eventually, probably her grandchildren would make it back to Jerusalem, to the temple, to re rebuild and do what they could. So, you know, we hear mostly about the men of the Bible, you know, all the heroes. There was King David, and there was Daniel, and there was uh, Moses, and... and uh, Isaiah, and all, but there was some, women did some pretty important things too. And what's amazing about these two stories is they actually got written down about women. And they had names. If you ever read the Bible, the women, most of the women didn't have names. And, but even still what we get, you know, we, they have to be connected to a man to have any kind of legitimacy. That was just the way it was back then. And it was kind of like livestock are now, you know, whose livestock is that on the road? You know, they don't get to be independent. And so we have these two women who kind of shine for us, helps lead us to the promised land. And I think they were women who tried to enact justice and mercy, who tried to make things better for their people. And it was pretty messy, both ways. I'm aware of justice and mercy ministries that the Methodist Church has in areas around here. I don't know that much about Kansas. And what they're saying is that people need help. They don't need to be put in jail. Punishment does not change behavior much. Rehabilitation changes behavior. Punishment usually just leads to more problems for people. And so it's, it's all a different mindset. Somebody does something wrong to me. I think Leslie put this on Facebook this week. Somebody does something wrong to me. Somebody does something hurt me. It's probably because they're hurting already. And for me to try to hurt them back or get my way or get justice is only hurting those people more. And most people who will hurt you intentionally in your life are doing it because they have so much pain in their own life that they don't know how to do it any differently. And from what I've learned in the last six months is that when people are doing something wrong to hurt us, we need to do what we can to help them heal. At the very least, we can pray for their healing. Because healed people don't go around hurting other people. But hurting people will be the first to hurt somebody else. And the stories of these two women, you know, they saved the Jewish people. They got the Jewish people to the promised land, and then they saved the Jewish people from complete annihilation. And they did it in some pretty mean ways, so there's probably some hurting going on in their lives and in their hearts, too. We all have been hurt. Every one of us has experienced the pain of life. 
And most of the people I know in this room have worked through it. We worked through our grief. <laughs> I was telling my friend Rick, who's here this morning, he's, uh, you know, life is a, you know, we live, we, we hurt, and then we heal, and something comes along, and we hurt again, and we heal again. That's part of life. Some people don't know how to heal. Some people get hurt and they just stay down here and they want to hurt everybody else. And every time anybody says anything, they get hurt even more. And they become like victims of life. And we all know those people. And I think justice, mer justice and mercy require us to pray for those people for healing. That they know that their hearts are healed to a point where they don't have to hurt anybody else to feel good. A lot of times people feel so small that they want to hurt somebody else to make them feel make, make themselves feel bigger. And so this morning we have you know, to me justice and mercy, you know, and, and there's a reason why there why there is that scale, that like lawyer scale. So we're trying to do the right thing. We're trying trying to keep God's people alive and going forward. And sometimes it gets a little messy. And sometimes people get in our way and we got to figure out a way to deal with that. But we got to keep going forward. And we also need to keep healing. And we also need to keep other people, help other people in their healing, whether it be physical, psychological, mental, God, there is a wideness in God's mercy. God was looking out for the people of Israel. I don't know what the people on Sisera's side would, how they would have told the story, but at least we hear that God was looking out through a woman for the Israelite people. And then God was looking out through a woman to save God's people, the Jewish people, who would eventually return to the to send some back to rebuild the temple and to provide a, an atmosphere into which Jesus was born. And if it wasn't for these two women, we wouldn't have had Jesus. And so history has a way of working itself out. And we have a way of making a difference in history today. So let us look out for people who are hurting Let's cut them a little slack and let's see what we can do to help them heal. Let us pray. Gracious, loving God, you have given us so much. And as we approach Thanksgiving, may we have grateful hearts for women like Deborah and Esther who continue this day to try to lead us into the unbounded future. Now, God, open our hearts of compassion and mercy for those who are in pain. Let us, pray, let us pray for their healing. Let us do what we can so they can live with their hearts pain-free, even if just a few moments. Guide us, guard us, and stay with us, for we are your people. Amen. I have a story 